Good morning, FBC. It's good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Please stand with us if you're able and join us in singing the first song to honor our Lord today, Turning Over Tables.
you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that you promise where two or three are gathered, you'll be present with us, Lord. Lord, we are so grateful that we can bring the least of what we have to offer and lay it at the foot of the cross as an offering and a blessing back to you. But Lord, today, this weekend, I pray that you challenge our hearts to give even more, Lord, to give of our time, of our resources, of our hearts, of our thoughts, of our desires, to give them back to you, Lord. Lord, you are holy and you are with us, and we feel the peace of your presence, Lord. And I pray that you ignite us and inspire us today to not just leave that here, Lord, but to go forth into your community and reach a community in need. And Lord, we are grateful that when we have those moments and we don't know what to say, Lord, you have given us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Eugene Parker, and I'm a child of God, as are you. Amen? Thank you. Welcome to First Baptist Church in Norristown um, on this beautiful, beautiful morning. We also like to welcome those folks on Zoom. Um, thank you for joining us as well. Would you uh, please join us in our call to worship this morning? But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Deliver from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, even as we put our hope in you. Amen. Amen. So we come to our portion of the service where we'd like to uh, give thanks. Um, thanks to you as being obedient followers of his word. Um, and thanks for the gifts that God has already graciously provided us. Father God, we, we thank you. On the eve of our national holiday, thank you Jesus for that, we honor one of your disciples that was committed to spreading your word. We honor Dr. Martin Luther King and the courage, God, that you provided him in showing the world how to love. We pray that your blessings will be distributed to those in need tomorrow. We pray that those who need to hear your word, the stories of your unconditional love, that they are touched as well. We ask that you touch our hearts, Father God, here and now that we may hear, understand, and apply the message of fear and hope that CG will present to us this day. We continue to bless our pastor and his wife Liz and boys Owen and Logan for their discipleship. Bless this church, Father God. We may be small, but yes, we are mighty. We lift up our tithes and offerings to you and we give back to you who has made all things possible. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So welcome again on the eve of Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. We welcome our guests today, encourage you uh, to fill out the green card, if you could, and drop it off in the offering plate. Provide whatever you feel comfortable um, submitting, and we'll reach out to you privately. In addition to all, uh, if you have any prayer requests that you would like to hear uh, shared within the congregation in written form, please do so on the yellow card. Uh, and CG and Aaron will be collecting them later on in the service. Um, before we get into our oh, flowers, our flowers today are also are provided by the Nellie Smith Estate. 
So praises to the Nellie Smith estate for continuing to, to provide us with those beautiful flowers. Connection points. So our first one is MLK, Community Outreach Day. Praises. Um, we are going to be busy. We are going to be busy. We have four opportunities that we're really going to kind of focus on. The one um, is the Laundry of Love, where we're going to go out to the local laundromats and provide um, uh, free um, wash as well as soap and, and um, dryer sheets to those folks and, and just to let them know that God loves them and cares about them for no other reason, right? Just, just to do that. Um, that one is currently full, but we could definitely use your, your, your praises, your prayers, uh, and I think funding is also available for that. Um, also, another opportunity is room number three, right? Room number three here at the church um, is going to be our new youth group uh, room. So that needs a little redesign. That, that's to put it gently, we're going to clean it out. We're going to toss some stuff, we're going to make some room, and we're going to make it look like a, like a youth room would, would, would be, you know, encouraging for the, for the youth to come in and do that. We also have an event at the Carver Center. Uh, I believe that's going to be inside. Um, Pastor CG and a couple others will, will be leading that charge. Um, and the fourth one is down by, on Harding Boulevard, there's an armory down there. I believe it's somewhat, some people call it the PAL Center as well. But there appears to be a, a lot of trash along the side of the road, so we'd like to shed some love there. Anything else on MLK Day? All right, small groups. So as I mentioned earlier, where small groups will start on February. Uh, this is a different one. This is, uh, this is a small group at the Coates' house. All right, that will start on begin January 21st. All right. Uh, join us as we finish this book, Crazy Business. All right. So that's on Sundays, 5 to 7. All right. And then this is the small group I was referring to earlier um, where we have, you know, curriculum that where we're using the church's um, money that's associated with Christian Ed to buy new curriculum for the small group group, small groups. So you can see we have a youth group. We have the men's Bible study. Thank you. A little delayed action, but I'll take it. Um, and then we have the women's Bible study. So there. Oh, snap. Oh, come on, man. Those girls got us now. Yeah, right? So, uh, yes, we encourage you. Again, use your connection points where you get to, uh, you know, use, apply God's word uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. All right? So it's a great feeling. So that, that's uh, the, the, the new name of that will be Break on Burnside. All right, and that'll start at 6.30 p.m. Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone on Zoom. So in two weeks, we have a very short, and I promise, a very short business meeting. We literally have to change one word in the bylaws. We are currently on a triannual business meeting schedule, so the meetings are in April, August, and December. <clears throat> Excuse me, last August, the vacations and everything, the participation was a, a little low, so we decided a, a council meeting to change that meeting to September. This will not take very long. We just need some folks here, members of the church that are uh, able to vote, and then we can get that done. Uh, we'll uh, finalize the bylaws and move on. So then the three meetings in 2024 will be April, September, and December. Thank you. Hey, so how's everything? How's school? How's everybody doing? Doing well? Yeah? So we're, we're talking about, I wanted to talk to you guys about helping, helping. Who, who knows what that means, helping? Helping someone in need. Moses, you hit that right on the head. Anybody else care to share about me? What, what's, what's help mean? It means sharing, exactly, right? Sharing what opportunities you have to, to give to somebody else, right? So your church family will be doing that on Monday um, for, a, uh, for a holiday that we call Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And he, Martin Luther King, yep, you've heard of him? He changed the rules. Moses, come on up here next to me, my brother. Come on, get up here. You and I are going to preach this one. So, he changed the rules. So, MLK. So, he can let others come to the same school. Exactly right. 
right? So that we all can love on each other together, right? Yeah. Nobody's any different than anybody else. Do you think helping your mom and dad is the same as helping people, you know, in the community? Yeah. I think it's the same, right? Right? Sure. It's just we're practicing how we can help, how we can help each other. So I just want you to think about other ways that you can help people, especially on Monday. But don't stop on Mondays. Do it any time you can, right? But it's to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, and that's because what, Moses? What did he teach us? He, te he teaches us to learn and to love, to help each other. To help each other. Yes, indeed, my brother. Good job. Good job. Good job. So let's stand up, face the congregation, put your hands out so you can receive that love. We ask the congregation to put your hands out and to bless these children as we pray. All right? Father God, we praise you. We thank you for these young folks, dear Lord. We thank you for the message that they already know. The seed has been planted, dear Lord, in, in, their, in their hearts um, as we continue to water them and to love on them as they follow your guidance. In God's name we pray. Amen. Good job. Good job. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask for a blessing on the lives, uh, uh, the many lives that enter and exit this church on a regular basis. We ask for healing in the lives that are in need of that healing right now. We ask for rejoicing as uh, there's so many praises of new life in the, and new healing that has happened for those and just new uh, ways that we can worship you, Lord, that we can celebrate uh, the risen King who has blessed us each and every day and that has given us hope in this new year. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so if, you, if you're new here, if you, you, have, you weren't here last week, we, were, we talked about our new word for the entire year. We're talking about hope. And we've been learning about this new word of hope here at FBCN. And our year verse is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And why don't we all say this together? That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the Lord, in the Holy, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Right, so we're tr striving to be better, right? We're trying to grasp hope. We're trying to make it tangible in our lives. And one way would be tomorrow. We're trying to make it tangible on this MLK Community Day. Sign up afterward, please. Because we want to bring that hope of Jesus Christ um, that gives us new life each and every day and be able to tell others about that. Last week we discovered in First Timothy that our focus on hope means that we can't just like wait around. We can't just wait for it to happen. We need to act upon it and make it true right here, right now with our talents, right? We talked about a baseball bat and how in my hands it's not worth much. It might be only worth 20 bucks, but in the hands of someone like Kyle Schwarber of the Phillies, who was the best hitter of, of 2023, um, it's worth millions of dollars. Or a skateboard is only worth probably 50 to 100 bucks in my hands, but in Tony Hawk, who completed 900, one of, some guy I love to watch skate each and every day, even at an older age, he is still able to really shred it. And he makes, he's like, I think, worth $150 million today. So when our talents are used for the Lord, they might not be worth much to others, like a baseball bat or a skateboard to me. But when I give what the Lord has blessed me with, whether it's my guitar, whether it's telling people about the word of Christ, whether it's the, or the talents that you have, it's priceless. And we give it to the Lord and let him use it on our behalf. We can do great things for many generations. To me, this week, I don't know about you, has made me once again fear for my life to board an airplane. I mean, have you seen the news lately? Plane after plane is experiencing true fear of mishaps and some close calls in the news. Yes, I know it's safer statistically 
to be on a plane compared to being on the road. But honestly, I'm on the road much more than a plane. So, of course, that statistic is going to match up for those in the, you know, the middle and the lower class society who rarely get on a plane. But I bet that statistic might go up. If, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm, getting, I'm in control of that, of that call, right? But that statistic would kind of rise up if I was someone who just fully relied on air travel every day for work and going home and whatnot. Anyway, if you didn't hear, uh, check these out. The 737 MAX 9 planes, they've been all halted across the world these past few days, ever since a few recent issues had happened with them. A recent United Airlines flight had to make an emergency landing in Florida because the door indicator lights turned back on mid-flight showing that something was wrong with the door. And so that fear was setting in in my life. I don't know about you when I saw that news. And of course, the news was making a big deal about it because they, they had to talk about it. And my heart's racing. And thankfully, there's no flights on my horizon right now. But um, still, it's, uh, it's on my mind. Yet people are able to find um, like a positivity in, in the midst of fear. I found this really cool news clip that I saw the other day about the 737 MAX 9 plane that had to make an emergency landing last week. And that was the big, the bigger of the news. So let's, let's take a look if you didn't see that it. Missing, missing door plug from the Alaska Airlines flight has been recovered. For the first time, we're hearing from the man who found it. The gaping hole forced the plane to make an emergency landing and grounded more than 170 Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes. Portland teacher Bob Sauer said he had been following the news all weekend and one person urged him to check his backyard and he couldn't believe his discovery. Once it got dark, I went out and uh, with my flashlight and in my backyard, which is forested and very dark, there was something gleaming that shouldn't have been there. And when it got closer, I found out it was that the door plug that had come from the plane. Meantime, we're hearing from passengers on board that terrifying flight on Friday night. Wesley Ogle from our sister station in Portland reports. Show me the selfie. Okay. Oh, the selfie, yes. It's a photo Kelly Bartlett says she never thought to take, but she's glad she did after living through the terrifying experience on flight 1282. The Wilsonville mom says about two minutes after the plane filled with wind, noise, and chaos, this happened. Somebody had jumped over me to sit down in that empty seat, and I just thought, where did you come from? Like, why are you? I didn't know what was going on, and all of a sudden, somebody new was sitting next to me. And he didn't have a shirt on, and it was really confusing because I had no idea why. Why was he moving? Why was he jumping over me? Where was his shirt? Like, I didn't know what happened. Then she looked three rows behind her. So at first I thought it was just the window, and then I realized it was the whole panel and that the kid who was sitting in that row, like, his seatbelt had saved his life because that's why he didn't have a shirt on, was the suction had just torn it off. She also got a look at his injuries. Not oh, this wow. one because you could see some of his injuries and how and the the redness so that's why I was like he had that cut on his neck it was too loud to talk but they could type with the notes app kelly learned his name was jack he and his mom were sitting next to the blowout but they are okay and then something else happened that she never expected and he said let's get a selfie to commemorate the experience i'm like okay so we kind of leaned in and <laughs> took a quick selfie which was funny and like I had not thought of that at the moment, but right now I'm kind of glad I have that picture. So yeah, that uh, that's really interesting that somebody would decide to take that selfie, right? And imagine being in the plane, sitting in your seat, and you're just shirt being entirely sucked out of the plane as the whole door plug comes right off. And you think a plane is loud when you're on it, when the doors are closed and it's in flight, but imagine not being able to hear the person next to you. They have to type. One another, to one another to communicate. And then imagine in the pain of getting lacerated, in the fear of getting sucked out, you jump to a new seat and you meet someone and you just show the positivity in your life that you have this new hope for being saved that day thanks to a seatbelt. So much so that, and of course, I, I, I love the younger generation and they just amaze me sometimes in a really awesome way. And they're like, hey, let's take a selfie. Because of course you need to commemorate your almost near-death experience, your fear has turned to hope instantly. Hope and fear. They're not normal synonyms, are they? O often one leads to another and even vice versa. I might say like, well, I, I fear I might lose my job, so I hope that I can do better to 
to prove my worth, right? Someone might say that. Or they might say, I hope that I can get an A in this class because I would hate to take this class again or repeat a new, another year of school. But what if I were to tell you that hope and fear are very much related? I found this next bit uh, in a recent psychology article. It says, when considering the concept of hoping that something will happen, there is an inference that it goes hand in hand with fearing that it won't. Similarly, when we fear that something will happen, we would infer that we tend to hope that it won't. This presents the possibility of a link. And potentially more than this, that the two are fundamentally joined in a way that may be impossible to separate. Physiology doesn't lie. They both cause anticipatory physiological responses, which are uncanny, uncannily similar. You get the sweaty palms, right? Excitement, the trepidation. But the only difference is the fact that one outcome is desired and the other is not. We are terrified that something may happen and this fear may be all-consuming. When we turn to hope, instead we shift perspective rather than fearing that it will happen. We start to hope that it won't. And in case of an, an event or a goal that we want to avoid, it may be a goal that we have not chosen. And it may be one that has been imposed upon us and that we have to have to deal with. Now, there are many survival stories, like that last video that we just saw, right? But I think of other survival stories where people just have given up and they've died. And yet, unbeknownst to them, they were maybe only a few miles from salvation. They were so close to that salvation, yet they still gave up. There are also stories where others have kept on and they've survived. Is it hope that has kept them going? If it isn't, clearly hope is a powerful tool for survival and one that isn't just an opposite to fear, nor is it something working against fear. It's a motivator that pulls us towards a goal, whereas fear is kind of this motivator of pushing us away. <clears throat> so if one's pushing one and the other's pulling, then double the force is created to overcome that inertia, get us going, and to keep us going through that adversity. So perhaps if hope is a survival tool, its evolutionary origins may be shared with fear. So imagine this. Imagine a situation where there was no such thing as hope. And we were faced with this overwhelming perception that we're, you know, we're about to die, that someone we love is about to die. How would we continue to function without hope? The fear would overtake us, wouldn't it? Ultimately, all hope in the world wasn't able to uh, you know, change the outcome for those who have experienced death in their life. And yet, because we all have experienced that in some way, and yet you kept on. You coped with that eventual outcome, and hope gave you time to adjust. It gave you time to rally around with others and the strength to deal with the things eventually. Now, many of you prayed in that dark time in your life. You know, putting your hope in the Lord, yet the fear remained, didn't it? It's like a, a, like a small din in the back of your head. It's still there. Think of, yeah, think of like a, a looming dentist appointment. Where's Devin? Devin's probably listening over there. Devin was telling me he's getting ready for a dentist appointment uh, in the next uh, day or two. And it's like, you know that dentist appointment's coming in, right? And as a kid, you, you're like thinking like, I was always happy about Christmas, but then my mom would always be like, we're having a dentist appointment like right after Christmas because so, you're, you're off for the day. And she did it every single year. And I was like, yay, it's Christmas. So no, I got to go to the dentist now. And it was always on the back of my head. That fear was in the back of my head. I know it's there. It's got to be done, right? You got to go to the dentist. But the hope 
will be that it's over soon, that dentist is going to take care of you, right? And it's reminding you that this fear and this hope, they remain together. So let's see what the Lord has to say about these two words, fear and hope. I encourage you to open up your Bible right now to Psalms 147, verses 10 and 11. Now wait for an amen when you get it. So David, who most likely wrote this passage uh, in, in Psalm 147, he starts with verse 10. And he says, His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. Hmm. Now this verse sets us up for hope because we take great interest in the power of God's creation, whether it's the strength of a horse or the strength of the legs of humans. God created these things, created these animals, created us, but they are not what fundamentally delights him. Interesting. Now, we can be engaged with this because I, we, we can't understand the strength of large animals in our world. For instance, did you know that some large horse breeds have been known to pull up to three times their own weight? That means they can pull up to 2,500 pounds or more. You know, if only we could be that strong, we're thinking, right? The things we could do. But David puts it in our perspective as well because he mentions that the human can run faster than all of the other smaller animals in our world today. So we're compared to these other large animals, not based on our strength, but based on the awesome power of God and what he created in each of us. But still, this is not enough to delight him. Do you know what it is? It's in our next verse, verse 11. It says, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. So it's those who fear him and put their hope in him. Both must happen for us to be fully aware of God's love for us. And it's an impressive thought that God should not only be at peace with some people, but he even finds pleasure in their company. The Lord delights in in those who fear him. Do you know what it says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7? It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if this is the beginning of knowledge, it is to know that God is in control before we even think of ourselves. It's a, it's a dedication for yourself to waking up each and every day and knowing that we are in the Lord's hands. Right? Yes, we have free will, don't get me wrong, but our choices must be made knowing that God's rule is first and it's final. You know, that's why it says the alpha and the omega. He is the alpha, he is the omega. More ways than one. But the fear is not something that we dwell upon. Just like any other fears that we face, we must face it head on. You know, running from it only means that we will have to face it one day. You know, let me uh, um, put it in a question for you. Actually, Becky, can I pick on you for a second? Yeah, all right. All right. Cool. So, okay. You uh, and a supernatural or super intelligent snail, you both get a million dollars. Sound good so far? Okay, great. But here's the thing. And you also become immortal. So here, that's another great thing about this. Okay. You both do. However, you die if the snail touches you, okay? Now, it always knows where you are and where you are, and it always tries to slowly crawl towards you. Would you take that deal, do you think? Nope. No? <laughs> Why not? That's a great deal. She was too quick on that. You know, I didn't. I didn't. I don't know. I would take that deal, but maybe I would take that deal. I'd have to think about what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, that's the hard part is getting that snail. I mean, it's going pretty slow, but it, it can get on a plane if it's got a million dollars, right? You're too quick on that, Becky. <laughs> it's a million dollars. All right, what, if it's $10 million, would it then? Oh, oh now she's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. No. All right, so what's your plan now? She said yes, everybody online. All right, but now you got to have a plan. Right? That's the hard part because usually you're, you have to now run away from this fear that's in your mind all the time. I, you know, I think of the most uh, 
traditional horror movies out there. Um, I, I know Vince is a big fan of a, of a good horror movie, so this one's for you, Vince. You know, I think of like Jason, I think of Michael Myers, I think of like The Thing, Pennywise, Alien, Chucky, Leatherface, all those guys, right? They all do one thing, right, Vince? They, they follow after the hero, and they're trying to get them. And those main characters are constantly, you know, running away from their fear. But what happens usually at the end? The hero realizes they got to face their fear. And they got to take them on in some way. Now, I'm not saying that God's not the evil bad guy in, in your horror movie called Life, okay? But God's not that. God is not that evil bad guy in all of this, thankfully. But he is someone that we must all face. That's the hard part. Because in life, we're going to have to face those consequences. You know, Revelation talks about this. Chapter 20. It says to the non-believer as well. And I saw the dead. <laughs> great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades throned into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Just like in those horror movies, we need protection, right? And it's not from the Lord that we need the protection from, mind you, but, but in fact, the Lord, who we fear, will give us that protection. And it says so in Psalm. Chapter 60, verse 4. But you have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. So this banner, this flag, right? It's, it was a place of unity for the Israelites in the Old Testament. And these people who were so divided under so many different banners were now gathered together. They were all united as one under one banner under Yahweh, the Lord's banner. And the, the banner was also a place of battle. You would see that banner in every battle, right? They've been given an army. They've been given power to oppose the enemies from the Lord. And then lastly, that banner, it was a place of triumph. It was still standing after the battle, after the war. That banner still stood. This was a triumph in knowing that the book of life will have our name in it as long as we uphold Jesus' banner, saying that we are believers in him. You know, Spurgeon once said, they fear for they are sinners. They hope for God is mercy. They fear him for he is great. They hope in him for he is good. Their fear sobers their hope. Their hope brightens their fear. God takes pleasure in them both, in their trembling and in their rejoicing. You know, you might be asking, well, CG, what if I'm afraid to hope? What if I fear to hope in Jesus? And you'd be surprised at how many people are afraid to hope in God. Now, for many trust has been broken in their lives. You may have someone, you, you may have been someone who, who prayed, yet God did not respond, at least in the way that you thought it would. It left you disappointed with God. And do you know what it is to trust in the Lord, to, to believe him with all of your heart, only to find that he did not come through for you? It's a difficult place to be, friends. Yet many are. And most of us could share stories of how the outcome was the opposite of what we have prayed for in our life and believed. And this leaves some people feeling like there's just no longer a point to have faith. And it's intriguing that the Bible acknowledges this. Proverbs 13, 12. It tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So the Bible does not hide the reality of our feelings. So if you are someone who has 
a difficult time trusting God because of the past experiences in your life, you're not alone. I mean, this Bible right here has plenty of people that said it otherwise. There's plenty of people here that can attest and have stories of that fact. But there's still a remedy to your problem. We need to understand this biblical meaning of the word hope. We've been talking about hope and fear, right? And the way the Bible uses this important word of hope, it's much different than the way that we use it in our English language today. You know, we might say, well, I hope my favorite team, the Eagles, win the game, right? Perhaps we will say, I hope the, the weather holds up as I'm hearing the wind blowing outside our doors right now. And maybe it doesn't rain or maybe it doesn't snow. I hope that doesn't happen. Well, that's just simply wishful thinking, isn't it? You cannot know God and grow strong in faith with that wishful thinking. Faith is just the opposite, friends. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it helps us understand that faith and that hope. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that's very interesting, isn't it? Because if, we, if you see hope as that wishful thinking, then you're, you're kind of back to square one. Which is, you know, maybe God's faithful, maybe he's not. But the biblical word for hope, which is elpis, it literally means a confident expectation. An expectation of what is sure. So the reason we often lose our hope, we lose our confidence, is because our faith is in the outcome and not on God himself. So this is kind of a good way to inventory your own faith. Examine yourself to see whether you are trusting in the answer to prayer or to God, whom you're praying to. And therein lies that difference. You know, Jesus tells us in Mark 12, 12, or 11, 22, have faith in God. He does not say to have faith in the outcome, does he? But in God alone. So when our faith is in that right place, we can then live in the confidence of who God is. And then we can understand Romans 8, verses 24 to 25, that says, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, the, the author of Hebrews writes that we have a, a need of patience in our life. Right? You could also say that it's endurance, that's, in, that's perseverance in all of us. And what brings us the, this needed endurance? Well, it's hope. So if you're low on hope, you need to look to God once again. Romans 5.13 calls him the, the God of hope. But you cannot see hope as just that wishful thinking. Once again, if so, you will not receive anything from the Lord. For James 1, verses 6 and 7 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. God will fill you with hope. And you can once again trust in the sovereignty of God. To give your past hurts to the Lord just as you have given your past sins to him. And before long you'll be able to rejoice in his hope. Be patient in tribulation. And be constant in prayer. You know, as, the, as we're looking at this, Christmas uh, is over. I often think about the, the, the squalls that are coming in, right? The snow that's coming in. I think about Christmas. I know it's a over, but oftentimes I think about the Christmas carol, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem, in all of this. Because its lyrics, it projects what to expect of the, of the coming of baby Jesus, right? It's a, that, that song says, Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light, the Hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears. The hopes and fears of all the years. 
are met in me tonight. So our fear is gone now. And again, it's only that small din in the back of your head. It's always going to be there. Don't get me wrong. It's always going to be there. But it's only made possible in the true hope of Jesus Christ. We put our hope in Jesus and his ability to supernaturally strengthen us, deliver us, guide us, and direct us through the hard times of life. Today, we need to embrace true biblical hope. It, it comes from faith. You have to believe in Jesus, that, and that might need to happen for you today. And I want to offer that chance to you today in this new year. And it comes from believing, seeing, and then receiving Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And it comes from the Holy Spirit's insight and direction. It comes from trusting in truth and rejecting the lies. It comes by forsaking sin. It comes through having a vision of your divine destiny. And it comes from the throne of heaven and the Bible. And it comes through and from Jesus. And when we do this, we find true biblical hope. It changes our perceptions. It encourages us. It empowers us. And it gives us visions of breakthrough. And it helps us focus on the real purpose of life. That real biblical hope, it's, it's not abstract. It's a living hope like we sang last week. And when we find it, we know it, we experience it. And we embrace it with love. And it changes everything. Will you pray with me, church? Dear God, when darkness surrounds me, I cling to the hope that you provide. Not just a, a glimmer of hope, but a radiant and unwavering light that penetrates even the deepest shadows. Let your light shine through the darkest crevices of my life, bringing not just faith, but an optimism so profound that it can pierce through the heaviest of life's burdens. I know that with you, all things are possible, and your boundless hope is a beacon that guides me through the darkest nights of despair. Thank you for being my unwavering source of hope, which I hold dearer than life itself. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Sides, but that is okay. We want to make sure you get sent home quickly. So we understand if you have to get going. Uh, we want to bless you right now. Let's just pray real quick. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope and the fear that you give us each and every day. That we have a fear of you and for of, of all that you've given us. And uh, that fear might be the pains that we go through each and every day. But the hope is in your son, Jesus Christ, who empowers us each and every day. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, go in peace and sign up for MLK Day on your way out. Please do.